very famous chapter here regarding King David and his sin with Bathsheba and then his, his um, you know, Nathan the prophet basically confronting him and giving him this, this big story about another man and his lamb. And basically he's, he's just equating, using a, a very similar story to what David just did. And David getting all angry and saying, you know what, that man, you know, he's going to die. He's going to put him to death. And Nathan said, you're that man. And just confronting him, just, just flat up, right in his face. And um, David finally having to answer for his sins and being confronted with the sin. What I'm preaching about this evening is receiving correction. David needed to be corrected. He needed to be confronted with a sin. Now, obviously, there's a horrible sin. It's a grievous sin. I mean, the sin of committing adultery and murder. And notice in this chapter, God doesn't hold back from him. The word of the Lord does not soften the message at all with the grievous sin that David did. He literally calls David a murderer. He says, yeah, maybe you didn't kill him with your own sword, but you used the sword of the enemy to kill him. And it was his orders. If you remember the story, David is the one that sent the death orders by Uriah's own hand. He was that faithful of a servant unto David that David was able to write out the orders saying, send him into the hottest part of the battle and then retreat from him and let him get killed in the battle. And he sealed that note and he put it into the hands. Uriah unwittingly was carrying his own death sentence, but he was so faithful. He didn't open it up, didn't bother to look, wasn't any of his business. He was a messenger, brought it to Joab. And of course, Joab um, didn't exactly carry out David's plan because other people, he didn't just completely retreat from him, but he did, you know, Uriah did end up dying as a result. And, and it was from David's order. So David was the murderer. Here. Notice there's, a, there's multiple things I want to teach on today. And, and this all is, a, is an important part of receiving correction. We're a church here that, and the way that, that I preach, a lot of people get turned off, they get ruffled feathers, and you notice in the announcements there's this red hot preaching conference coming up. And oftentimes it's referred to as hard preaching or hot preaching. And the reason why, you know, I'll preach on the hellfire and damnation. I'll preach on the sins of the Bible that the Bible calls out as wickedness and sins. Why? Because we're all sinners, first of all, and we want, we ought to be coming to hear God's word so that we could repent, so that we can get right with God in whatever area that may be. We all need correction. Okay, who, who here is perfect? Have you just got everything laid out? You don't sin anymore? Yep, got it all taken care of. You know, I don't even need to read the Bible anymore. I know what it says everywhere. No one's like that. We know that. I mean, otherwise we'd, we'd crown you Jesus Christ, right? And, and that would be ridiculous. Of course, we know we're all sinners. We know we're all in need of correction. Amen. And the way that we do things here is I try to be as, as scriptural and as biblical as possible. And we have an example here of Nathan approaching David. And he doesn't hold back. He doesn't, he doesn't try to soften it up at all. He's just saying real bluntly, Look, David, here's an example. Here's, you know, I'm going to give you this, this, this story of, of a man. And when he's all done with it and David already pronounces the judgment, he says, that's you. You're that guy. We need to be able to, when you hear Bible preaching, one of the most important things is you have to be able to understand if you are the person that needs correction. Way too often these days, people attend churches and they'll sit and they'll hear about certain sins. They'll hear about things in the Bible and they'll be thinking in their mind, oh man, I'm glad so-and-so showed up tonight. Oh man, this person really needs to hear about it. And the whole time they're thinking, everybody else needs to hear this message and they never turn it on themselves. The attitude that we ought to have every time you're sitting in church is not thinking, who else needs to hear this? Think about yourself. We need to have that humble attitude, that humble approach, having our ears lowered and, and just ready to listen and to receive correction. Now, not every sermon, if, especially on sin, is going to be something that you're necessarily guilty of. But you need to have that attitude and that approach of just saying, is this something I need to work on? Can I honestly evaluate my own life and what I'm doing, my own heart, and be able to just say, 
you know what, I actually have a problem in this area and I need to work on this and it needs to be corrected. Now, David had the right response to being confronted with his sin, to having someone just point it out and be like, you are guilty, sir. And this, is, this isn't even in a church setting. I mean, no, this is Nathan, the prophet of God, just confronting David individually and saying, that's wickedness and that's a sin. You're that man. John the Baptist did it, got him into prison. Remember for Herodias' sake, Herod's brother, Philip's wife that he married? John the Baptist said, that's wicked. You can't, you know, God's law says you shouldn't be doing that. He wasn't afraid to call it out. Now he needed it, and people, you could have one of two reactions. When you hear something that you're guilty of, you could, you could resist. You said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. No, you got, you, know, you got it all wrong. Oh, but you have to understand and start making excuses and justifications for your sins. Or you can just humble yourself like, King, like David did here in verse 13. He said, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You're right. I've sinned. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. And God showed mercy unto David. Now these sins are grievous. Adultery by itself is guilty, is, is worthy of the death penalty according to God's law. That's bad enough of a sin for, for that person to deserve death. That's how grievous and serious it is. But not only did he do that, he also had Uriah the Hittite killed, making him a murderer. So twice he's guilty of murder. Yet God, for whatever reason, I mean, his long-suffering and love and mercy extended that mercy unto David. Now, he didn't go unpunished. By any means, he did not go unpunished, but he spared David's life. The life of the child, as we saw here in this chapter, God said, that child's going to die. And that is a direct repercussion of David's sin. And it's a good example showing you that when we get into sin, it affects other people. Yeah. And a lot of people have promise. They'll say, well, wait a minute. That child didn't do anything wrong. And they'll try to blame God for, for causing this evil and this harm to come upon this child. And then they say, God, how could you do this? You're an evil God. You're a wicked God. And that's what the atheists will try to say. And people who hate God will try to say. But they don't realize that God is not the cause of that. He's carrying out the, the, the just recompense that, that he sees fit. But it's David's fault. It's not God's fault that, that, that David went and committed adultery and that Bathsheba was, was with child as a result of that sin and that that child had to die. It's David's fault for those things. It's not the Lord's fault. And another interesting here, as long as we're in this chapter, I like to bring this up. It's a good place to highlight in your Bible for people who don't understand whether or not, you know, a lot of people have problems with... Um, with like this Calvinist doctrine of people being foreordained to even heaven or hell and, and like God picks and chooses who's saved or other people who think that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. This, ver this uh, passage is very clear that babies, infants, you know, children that die go to heaven. And here's where it says that, just, just so you know, it's not what the sermon's about, but look at verse 23. This is David explaining, because they're, they're wondering, like, wait a minute, you were fat. Like, they were afraid to even tell him that the child had died because he was so just weeping and fasting and just not eating anything. You know, no one even wanted to approach him. And they're thinking, wow, like, he's already this upset. What are we going to do and tell, you know, how are we going to tell him that the baby died? But then after they told him, he got up. You know, he, he cleaned up and he was able to sit down and then have a meal. I mean, he was fasting because he was praying unto God. And he explains, he's like, look, while the baby was alive, there was still a hope that God could still extend some mercy on this child and the baby would still live. He said, that's why I fasted and, pray, you know, and, and was doing everything I was doing. He's like, but now the baby's passed out. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it anymore. There's no reason to continue to entreat the Lord to show mercy once the child's already passed. And he explains this in verse 23. He says, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? We said, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And then he says this, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now, David knew that he was saved. He knew that he was a believer on the Lord. He knew that his faith was in God. He knew that he had eternal life. And the only way he could make that statement on knowing whether or not the child 
You know, like, how else is he going to go to him? If the child could have possibly gone to hell, David knew he wasn't going to hell. So if, if for him to say, I'm going to go to him, but he's not going to return to me, he knew that he would be with the child in heaven. He knew that that's where the child went. And there's other, you know, I've preached actually an entire sermon on this subject. I'm not going to do that today, but this is one, of the, one reference. It's not the only reference. It's a good reference to have, though, to show that, you know, the baby didn't need to be baptized to go to heaven. And God doesn't just, just arbitrarily pick and choose people to, to that you're saved, you're not saved. It is, um, you know, this child was still innocent because it had not um, commit any sins of its own that it could be held accountable for. So, um, and that's a whole other topic of original sin. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But let's, um, in uh, Proverbs chapter 15, because we're talking about receiving correction tonight, being able to handle being rebuked when you're wrong. Now, David's sin was serious. Hopefully, nobody in this room would ever get into that serious of sin. I, I pray to God that that doesn't happen. But we all do have our own sins. And no sin should be just taken lightly. Because it's not taken lightly in God's sight. All sin, according to the Bible, is worthy of a punishment of hell, of eternal torture and torment and a fiery hell. All sin is, is worthy of that. So in that perspective, anytime we sin, it is a big deal against God. So we need to be ready to hear and to listen, to be able to accept reproof. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, verse 31, the ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. He's basically saying, look, if you can hear reproof, if you can take it, if you can allow someone to correct you, you're living with the wise people, that you are a wise person to be able to accept that. And the guy that refuses instruction, you can't tell him what, you can't tell him where he's wrong. He despises his own soul. It's only going to lead to your own destruction if you can't be corrected. If you can't accept some godly correction, you're going to continue in your error. And nobody ought to be so proud to think that they're above reproof. They're above correction. Myself included. Look, we all need to be able to humble ourselves when we are in error somewhere to be able to receive a correction. Proverbs 29.1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. And God's saying, look, if he's trying to get hold of you and, and bring the reproof and bring the reproof and bring the reproof and you're hearing preaching and you're reading in the Bible and you're seeing over and over again and you keep hardening your neck and you stiffen your neck to that and you don't want to be corrected, you don't want to be reproved, the Bible says you bring to yourself, uh, you're suddenly going to be destroyed and that without remedy. There's no fix for that. He's saying you could do, you know, the, the more you just continue to harden your neck, harden your neck, harden your neck, pretty soon you're going to get yourself to a, in a condition that's just beyond hope. And you're just going to dis end up ultimately just destroying yourself if you can't be corrected in, in, these, in these manners. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 51. We're going to see a little bit more of an insight now into David's actual response. In this story, we just see David saying, you know what, I've sinned. Right? I've sinned greatly. I've sinned against the Lord. And he acknowledged his sin as soon as he was confronted with it. But Psalm 51 really gets to the, David's heart of the matter and of his repentance and how he felt about this sin and what was going on inside of him. We see this, uh, this great psalm, Psalm 51. We're actually going to read the whole thing because this is something, and keep this in mind as we're reading the scripture, this is the attitude that we ought to have when we realize that we've been in sin. Psalm 51 verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He starts off just entreating the Lord, Lord, please forgive me for this. Please just, just get, extend mercy unto me. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And this is the first step that a lot of people are unwilling to take is just acknowledging their sin. Most people don't want to admit that they've done wrong. It's a big step. It's a first step. You have to be able to take that though. You have to be able to look at this and say, you know what? 
yes, I failed. I've done wrong. And then you go to God seeking his mercy and seeking that, that forgiveness that can only come from the Lord. You have to acknowledge the transgressions. Verse 4, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That's what he wants to come out of you when you're sinning, when you have done wrong to just be broken and to admit and just say, God, I'm sorry. And to mean it, not just give lip service, but just to honest to goodness in the bottom of your heart, be broken and say, God, I'm sorry. I've done wrong, Lord. And, you know, there's nothing I can do. Just please extend mercy unto me. I, I, you know, I, I won't do it again. Renew a right spirit within me. Renew my heart. Help me to do what's right, dear Lord. I want to do what's right. And I'm sorry for what I've done. That's wrong. He says in verse 18, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Now, we need to be able to apply Bible teaching to ourselves, and not just the preaching that you hear here, but even just in your daily reading. And when you're studying the Bible, when you're reading and looking at the Bible, think, how does this apply to me? Especially when you're reading about various sins, because you have to ask yourself, how holy do you really think you are? And this is where a lot of people get into problem with pride when they start having this holier-than-thou attitude. And you'll notice this, and I'm going to point out the... the the connection here, we saw it in the opening chapter. There's a response, there's, there's an attribute that people tend to have when they're in sin, when they've got their own blaring sins in their life, have a tendency to be willing to judge everybody else. Yeah. And David did that very thing. Nathan came to them, came to him with this example which completely mimicked his own, except on a much smaller scale because it involved an animal, not a human being, not a wife of, of, of another man that was trusted to him. You know, he uses the poor man with, with his one you know, goat that was like his, his child because they, they cared for it so much, as opposed to David taking another poor man's wife. And he was all angry and hot and just... That guy needs to be put to death. He was willing to cast that judgment on someone else when he had this big old beam in his eye of his own sin. And said, so, I mean, you would think someone in that much sin would be able to back off a little bit and be like, well, maybe we should show him a little bit of mercy. Right. You know, you'd think that someone that is in need of so much mercy is going to be a little bit softer on the guy, but no. Right. And honestly, you'll find this to be the case in many, many, many examples where people have these, these huge sins in their life and then they're the first ones just, just willing to, to judge everybody else for what they're doing. That's right. And I'm going to get into that portion a little bit later. Right now I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look at a bad example of receiving correction. David was a good example. We got to see a little bit into his heart in Psalm 51 and how much he really was sorry and how much he was pleading with God and just begging for mercy. 
He had a contrite spirit. He, he had a broken heart. He was, he was willing to receive that correction, and it was honestly inside of him. He, he had that, and I think that's one of the reasons why God did extend mercy unto him. Now, he paid for it, and it wasn't even just with that death of that child. He, he ended up paying for his sins in, in, in other aspects, too. Um, it talked about when um, ultimately the fulfillment was when Absalom took his concubines and, and laid with them in the sight of, of all Jerusalem. And in the sun, they set up a tent on the, on, the, on the rooftop, and he went in on the David's concubines after he was kind of uh, usurping and, and taking over the kingdom, and David had to flee. Um, that was another thing, and Absalom ended up dying. He lost um, another, you know, other of his sons as well. I think he ended up losing four or five of his children, which I believe are all a direct or indirect result of what he did here with this grievous sin. He did it. God chastised him. Better believe it. And anybody who is born again, every child of God, will receive chastising and discipline. He didn't just get away with it for nothing. God did bring a discipline, but he also extended some mercy as well. Because David did deserve to die. He did deserve to be put to death, but God extended that mercy unto him. Now, just consider within yourself, you know, as we look at this and as you read this, you know, when's the last time you've apologized to God and felt remorse for some sin in your life. I mean, just, just think about that for a minute right now on, on your own personal life where you have thought, you know what, I'm in sin here and, I've, and have actually been sorrowful about that sin enough to confess to God and to be sorry about what you've done as opposed to just, well, yeah, I've sinned. And just blown it off and shrugged your shoulders and just continued on. God doesn't like that type of an attitude. We ought to have more respect for God's laws and His commandments for us in our life to be able to, to feel sorry for when we do wrong. And if you could sit here right now and think, I don't even know the last time that I've like, uh, like been sorry for what I've done wrong, then you have a problem then you are the man that needs correction tonight. You are the person that needs to be able to analyze and say, look, because look, none of us are perfect. Right. And I know that for a fact. You, everybody has sin, myself included, and we need to be able to, and look, there are times when you may be doing all right throughout the day or the week or whatever, but there's times when you know you sin. When you know you've done wrong, you know there's something you should have been doing and you didn't do it. And we ought to be grieved in our heart and humbly and meekly apologize to God and have a sorrowful spirit. And many people, not even can they, do they not apologize to God, but they don't even apologize to anyone. And that's a proud person that cannot swallow their pride and just ever admit that. Are you that person? Are you someone that can never admit fault when you've done something wrong? Are you never able to just apologize to somebody? Look, I've made mistakes before. I know, I mean, I'm married, my wife and I, you know, time to time you get in arguments, you, you, know, you do something, maybe you perceive something different, but it's like, you know, there's been times where it's been my fault where, you know, I, I might end up getting angry or upset with my wife over something that I misunderstood. And then it's like later on, I have to be able to swallow my pride and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't understand. You know, like I was wrong. And the only way you can do that is to have enough humility. God hates pride. Go back and listen to the sermon on pride that I preached about a month ago. That is one of the sins that God hates. He does not want you to have that proud hurt. We all ought to be able to just admit when we've done wrong. Is your heart truly ready to be corrected? Or does the preaching never seem to apply to you? I mean, if you could come here service after service after service after service after service, and I go over a wide variety of, of the Bible. I mean, we go through chapter by chapter on our Wednesday night. We go on different topical sermons throughout, you know, on Sundays. If you could just sit here and say, like, it never applies to me, you might want to rethink that. You might want to check yourself on, are you ready, are you ready to receive correction or not? Let's 
Let's look at the bad example of King Saul. King David was a great example of someone who had humility, of someone who loved God. And, and yes, he committed horrible sins, but he was able to, to honestly, from his heart, just completely be disgusted with his own self and, 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 and beg for mercy upon God and show the repentance that he had over what he did and then continue with his life and still end up being successful. Don't think that you have to just pretend like your sins don't exist because you're afraid that that's going to cause you to be unsuccessful. Once you've already done them, you've already done the damage. Just confess it and forsake it. Confess it to God and forsake those sins so that you can move forward. King Saul was somebody who was not able to do that. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. That's where I had you turn. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to start off now. King Saul had been reigning for a little while here where we catch up in this, in this story. Look at verse number 2 of 1 Samuel 15. The Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. These are God's orders unto King Saul. God says, you know what? I'm going to bring judgment on Amalek. I remember what they did. I remember what they did to Israel in the way. And he says, this is your job, Saul. You need to go. You need to utterly destroy. You need to wipe them out. Leave nothing left. That was his orders. Let's see what he did. Let's, um, verse number 7. We're going to jump down to verse 7. It says, And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Now, did God say to take the king of the Amalekites alive? Or did he say to wipe them all out? He said, wipe them all out. And then he says, and utterly destroyed all the people at the edge of the sword. So he almost did what God told him to do. This way. He wiped everybody else out, all the other people, but he saved the king alive. Let's keep reading here because it didn't stop there. Verse 9, it says, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and, of the, and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So they did not obey and do exactly what God told them to do. Verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the, Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So right away, Saul's not even like, like he's just oblivious to the fact that he just did not regard what the Lord had told him to do. He's just thinking, hey, everything's great, right? I did what God told me to do. Blessed be thou of the Lord, Samuel, come on up here. Look, I did everything that God told me to do. Samuel answers him, verse 14, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So what do you mean you did what God told you? Why am I hearing these animals? Where did you get these guys from? Verse 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. You know, they, you know, the other people have, right? I didn't do it. They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So see, look, no, 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 you don't understand. You, you don't understand. I, I really did obey God. But what we did was see the people, that see, they went and they brought the best because we're going to offer it up to God. It, it, it's all for God. But that's not what God told you to do. We're going to see that in the story. Let's keep reading here. Verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And see, here's that pride kicking in. 
He points out the fact when you were little in your own sight, that's when God exalted you, implying that the reason now he's having these problems is because he's proud. Now he's been king for a little while. Now he's got that taste of power and authority. Before he was afraid. When they anointed him king, he was hiding among the stuff. He was real meek and humble. And then he got into this position and it went to his head. And now he thinks he can do no wrong. And whatever God tells him to do, you know what? I might change it a little bit. And who cares? I'm still doing what's right. Verse 18, And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, look at this, remember when David was confronted? When he said, thou art the man, he said, I have sinned against God. Look at, look at Saul's response. Verse 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Yes, I did obey. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21, But the people, again, casting the blame, of, like, I did what was right, but the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. He's saying, you think you're doing this great thing by offering up this sacrifice. God doesn't care about your sacrifice at all. What he cares about is your obedience. When he says something, he wants you to respect it and do it. Don't think that you're doing something great for God when you disobey him in order to offer up those sacrifices. And many people these days think that, oh, I'm doing all this stuff for God when it's not what God told you to do in the first place. You think you're doing so much and offering and sacrificing so much unto God. Do what he just told you to do. Just, just listen to the basics. Obey what he has for you to do because he's going to have a lot more pleasure out of you being willing to listen and obey what he says than he has pleasure over how much money you drop in the offering plate, for example. He doesn't care the dollar, you know, what you're throwing in if you're not just being obedient to him and listening to him. Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, Now, now he finally says, I have sinned. But we're going to read through this because He's still not completely repentant in his heart. He says at this point he's sinned, but I'll prove that to you. Let's keep reading. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So now he's kind of revealing a little bit, saying, you know what, I have sinned. And the reason why is because, you know, I actually was afraid of what the people were saying, and, and I wanted to listen to them, and he didn't give, you know, listen to God more than he should listen to man, and he let the people persuade him. So he's a good politician, right, but a bad king. Right. He feared the people. And we're going to keep reading here, and you're going to see this fear of the people. It still never really went away. He needed to fix this problem, but he didn't. Verse 25, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a, a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. So Samuel's going, like, he's like, well, just at least just come back with me. right? Just come back with me. Show everybody that everything's okay. And Samuel's like, I'm not going back with you. You rejected the word of the Lord. And he, as he's walking away, you know, Saul just, just, just goes out to reach for him and like grabs the, the end of his shirt, and it rips off his, off his clothing a little bit. And that's what, he turned, that's what the word rent means. You know, he ripped it. And he turns around and he's like, you know what? God's ripped the kingdom away from you. Yeah. He, he's taken you away from being the king over Israel. And then it says in, um, and he says, you've given it to someone better than you. 
He's already got someone lined up that's better than you. Verse 29, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that you should repent. Verse 30, Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Look, he's looking for honor. He doesn't deserve any honor. But he's looking for honor still. I pray thee, honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel. The same people that were causing him to sin, he still, he had a fear of the people, which is supposedly why he didn't wipe everything out, why he let them to bring in all of the best of the sheep and the best of the oxen. And now he wants to still look good in front of the elders of the people and before Israel because he still cared more about how he looked in the sight of the men than how he looked before God. The repentance wasn't there. He didn't fully get it and, 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 and change his ways and have a broken spirit like King David did. You notice all of the excuses that Saul made. Oh, no, no, I did, I did do what was right. And just not, not just willing to own up and just say, you know what? I was wrong. And even when he acknowledges sin, he still feared the people. Never really got that right. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Because now we're going to go into some of the, the judgment aspect of people who need correction and then are judging other people when they themselves need to just get right with God. There's a hypocritical judging that goes on. And you know what? That is what Matthew 7 is all about. A lot of people like to take the first two words and just think that the entire chapter or the entire Bible ends there because the first two words of Matthew 7 is judge not. Right? People just think, oh, yep, yeah, the Bible just says judge not, judge not. You can't judge anything. That's false. We can judge. Jesus said to judge righteous judgment. We don't judge according to the appearance. We judge righteous judgment. There is a judgment that is righteous. There is a time and a place for judgment to happen. Hey, Nathan judged King David when he said, Thou art the man. That was a judgment. And that was a righteous judgment. Nathan wasn't in all this sin. He wasn't committing adultery. He wasn't committing murder. He was righteous in being able to point out to David his sin and his errors. You, it's not that the Bible says you can never judge. Let's read Matthew 7 to see what it's actually teaching, what Jesus Christ himself was actually teaching about judging. Verse, uh, verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So what he's saying here is, you know, if you don't want to be judged, then you shouldn't be judging because the same judgment, the same application that you make to someone else, it's going to be brought back on you. So if you're willing to make a judgment on something or on someone, you better not be guilty of the same exact thing because that same judgment's going to come right back around on you. That's exactly what this is teaching here is that, hey, go ahead and judge and whatever judgment that you use, it'll come back to you. Verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite? First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And those are kind of older words, mote and beam, but like a mote is just a much smaller you know, a piece of wood or whatever kind of stuck in your eye. Obviously, if you've ever had anything stuck in your eye, it's not comfortable at all. But he's saying, okay, here's a person that has, they've got a little problem. They've got this small problem. Now, it's, a, it's kind of a big deal on your eye. You know, it, it causes a lot of, a lot of pain and, and discomfort and everything else. But you've got this small problem. And then you've got this other person. They don't have this little, they've got a big, I mean, they've got this big rod, this big pole just coming out of their eyeball, right? And they're saying, well, let me help you out with that. That's not the person you want helping you out with your little problem. <laughs> they can't see clearly themselves. And this is the illustration that he's giving. He's saying, look, don't be a big hypocrite. You know, if you get your first, get your own house in order. You know, if you're the person that's got all these various sins and all this, you know, major, you know, adultery and murder like David, you have no right to be judging other people on much smaller matters. That is a hypocritical judgment. But look what he tells them to do. He says, first, 
cast out the beam out of the eye. First, get yourself right. I mean, get that big beam out of your eye so you can see clearly. But once you can see clearly, then it's okay to help your brother get that little piece, you know, that little mote out of their eye. And that, that is okay because now you're not being a hypocrite and now you're helping them. And honestly, any rebuke should be with the motivation of correction, of doing what's right. Someone doing something in error versus doing something that's right. It's not mean. It, it shouldn't be mean. I mean, you should be able to, to, to be able to rebuke somebody in, in a humble way or in a, you know, in a meek way, in a way where um, you can get the message across, you know, in, a, in, a, in as loving as a way as, as possible to be able to let someone know, hey, but, you know, if they're wrong, they're wrong. And anyone who's wise is going to want to know when they're wrong. And, and look, if, if I have something stuck in my eye, just some little speck, I would be happy if someone can help me get that out, especially if I have problems getting it out myself. Man, this is really bothering me. I got this problem. You know, don't see about me. I would love for someone to come and just take that away. It's a good thing. Now, when they stick their hands in there and take it out, it might hurt a little bit more. You might feel that sting when you get that rebuke. You, know, you already got this problem in your life, and then you hear the rebuke. Oh, man, that's, that stings even worse. But you know what? That sting can end up then turning into something really good if you can acknowledge the rebuke and acknowledge your own sin and get right. right. Now, I'm going to use an example that's kind of close to home on judging without knowing all the circumstances and without knowing a lot about a situation. It's kind of an ignorant judging that happens all too often. And we need to be careful in our own judgments because, when, you know, oftentimes at Baptist Church, when you come to someone where you hear the fiery preaching and you hear the railing on sin and it's, and it's kind of exciting and it's really good and it's helping you out and you're cleaning up your life, oftentimes people will have this attitude then to start to form a little bit, especially as you start to clean up of kind of wanting to judge everybody. And you got to be aware of this because there's an appropriate time and an inappropriate time to judge. And there's times when you're being a hypocrite and there's times when you don't really know the full you know, spectrum of what's going on in a person's life. You just see one little thing and you think you know everything and you're just going to tell them what it's like. And the example I have is, is actually with my own wife. Now, I'm not saying anybody here is guilty of any of this stuff, but it's just an, an illustration to, to kind of make the point that I want to make. Many people might here might not even know this because it's not like we share every single detail or problem that we have in our own lives with everyone that we meet, but I'm just going to use her an example of, of, of with judging people. Now, when she was 19 years old, she had an accident. A really, really, really bad car accident where she was crushed inside of a vehicle and they needed the jaws of life or whatever they're called to come in and like get her out of there. That crushed her hips, broke her knee, broke, you know, is all these broken bones and scar tissue and all kinds of problems from the time she was 19 all the way up till today. She is someone that deals with pain on a daily basis, but she doesn't complain about it. And I live with her, I'm her husband, so I know firsthand what it, I mean, and I don't even know what it's like because I've never been through that. Okay, now anyone who deals with serious pain on a regular, continual basis might understand what she's going through. But if you've never gone through that, you don't understand. It is serious. It is, it is a problem when you have to deal every single day of your life with serious pain. That the only way that there is a fix now because of that accident, because of what happened, would just be to be on pain pills which is not a good option, which is not something that we are doing. Or very little, she's doing very little of that when it gets so bad that you can't sleep. But as a pastor's wife, you might look at her a little bit different than you'd look at any other person in the church, right? Because she's supposed to be this great example. Now, first of all, a pastor's wife is not a role in the Bible. It's not an office, it's not a deacon, it's not a bishop, it's not any specific role. She is a church member here, and she is my wife. So she does not have to live up to your expectations or anyone else's, okay, except for God's. 
and there is no specific role that she has to play. She is not required to do any of the things that she does for this church, other, any other than any other church member would. I just want to throw that out there because people kind of have this, this idea of, of a role of like a pastor's wife. She is to answer to me because I'm her husband and I'm in charge of the household. So whatever she has to do around the house, it's for me. I'm the one that judges over that. Now, I'll be honest with you, our house is not the most clean house, okay? We have big messes all over the place almost all the time. We have four little children, but you know what? That's acceptable to me. I know her situation. I know what she's capable of doing. I don't put a bar of a standard up of you need to have all this stuff done knowing that she is in a tremendous amount of pain. Other people might not know that, that she has this issue and might look at it and say, well, she must just be really lazy. I mean, look at this place. I keep my place so spick and spick. You know, because we have guests over, like, regularly. We open up our house to visitors. We have people that, I mean, we've got a full house, but we'll still open up. You know, and look, I'm not trying to lift ourselves up, but it's just, these are the things that are going on in our life. So without having all of that understanding, it may be easy to look and say, you know, how could you, how could you possibly let your, your child do this? Or how could you possibly do, you know, it's like, you don't know what's going on. Right. And it is not a righteous judgment to take somebody who has all these other things going on that you don't even know about. And to just, you know, I mean, she's got to deal with me. Okay? And I have a full-time job. And I passed her full time. So it's not like she's getting a whole lot of help around the house for me. She's got to raise the four kids, feed them, teach them, train them, clean the house, do all this stuff, and then do the things that I have for her to do also. So she has no obligation or no role for anyone else but me. And I am the one that is in judgment of that. But see, Unfortunately, a lot of, and, and look, I'm not, I am not accusing anybody here of any of this. I'm not even saying that this is like happening. It's just an example of how easy it can be from the outside to look at somebody or maybe to come over to our house sometime and be like, oh man, what's, you know, like, what's going on here? She must not do anything. What does she do? Just sit around all day? You know, and have that type of a judging attitude. Instead of just looking at your own self, I mean, Hey, that, 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 should be, that should be no problem for anybody anyways. Right. And there's areas of judgment where, like, if it doesn't affect you at all anyways, like, right. don't worry about it. Right. <laughs> but the areas that we talk about judging and righteous judgment is something where someone is in some serious sin that it's, it's going to be self-destructive, that it's not good for them. I mean, someone, you know, drinking and smoking and whatever. I mean, I can list off all kinds of sins that we know are sins from the Bible. But let's keep to that type of a judgment. And some things are inexcusable regardless of the circumstance, right? But other things, so I gave up a circumstantial situation where, okay, well, not everybody knows this. But it's something that, you know, you don't want to get the wrong idea and the wrong judgment on someone because you don't know all the details. There's other things when it comes to just serious sins. I mean, like David and, and committing adultery, I mean, if he started to make these, well, you know, I mean, she was, she was out there and I saw her. I mean, she shouldn't have been out there and just casting the blame off. No, you shouldn't have done that. That was wrong and that was wicked. And that's where the righteous judgment comes in. Amen. We need to keep this, this the, the proper mentality of judging to be able to make the righteous judgments and not just be so nitpicky on everybody else and everything else that they're doing and be able to focus more on ourselves. Now, if someone needs, look, if a brother needs correction, you know, do it properly. And, and hopefully we can help them out. But I have a, a tendency to think that there's, there's oftentimes a lot more judging that goes on than is necessary. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about the, the Lord's Supper. And it's, you know, Paul's teaching that, you know, if you, if you eat or drink of the, the bread unworthily, then you're going to bring damnation upon yourself. And he says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Talking about the church of Corinth. And he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And this is an attitude that we all need to take is, let's judge ourselves first. Before you go and cast judgment on anyone else, Let's judge ourselves first. 
and make sure that we're not guilty of things that we could be judged of before you're even going to go out and do any other type of judgment. It says in verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 26, the last place we're going to turn. We're almost done. Psalm 26, the last scripture. We need to be able to look upon ourselves and be able to, to, to judge ourselves. Oh, and one more thing I almost forgot. When it comes to judging righteously and the moat versus the beam, When you want to judge someone on like the smaller matters, I'm just going to say this flat out because I believe this, this wholeheartedly that you know, preaching the gospel is an extremely important aspect of the Christian life. And if you, are, if you do not preach the gospel to people, you have a big beam in your eye and you have no right to just be judging other people. That is what the Christian life is all about. Your own salvation, what good is it if you keep the salvation to yourself and you don't share that with anybody ever? You are not doing what your whole point in, in existence in this life is to be able to, to, sh to share that news with other people. I mean, like, like that is the number one thing in the Christian life is to be able to share that with other people. And... Look, if you don't show up to the soul winning times, okay, I'm not saying that you're guilty and you have this big beam. As long as you're at least preaching the gospel to other people in any aspect. I mean, it doesn't have to be out door to door. Now, it's one of the ways that we do it, but there's many ways that you can preach the gospel to people. You need to be actively opening up your mouth consciously and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not at least doing that, don't bother judging anyone else because you've got a beam. And that beam needs to be fixed. And if you realize today that I have this beam because I never preach a gospel to anyone, you know what? Amen, if you could recognize that and show up, speak to me personally, I will help you to the best of my ability so that you can get that beam out of your eye and be able to preach the gospel to somebody else. I will, I will do whatever it takes to be able to help you in that area of your life. But it's up to you individually, if you have recognized for yourself that it's a problem, to be able to, to admit it and just, just say, you know what, I want to fix that. Okay? Because if you don't want to fix it, no one's going to be able to help you. You need to have the humble heart that's ready to receive the instruction. And the instruction's here. I'm, I'm, I am available completely to help you with that. Psalm 26. As we read this, this is, this is another Psalm of David. Think about if you would be able to, and Psalms are songs, right? Can you sing this Psalm unto God and mean it from the bottom of your heart? Psalm 26, verse 1. Judge me. O oh Lord, would you even want to say that to God? Judge me. Are you that confident in your walk where you can just confidently call to God and say, God, judge me. Judge me, O oh Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O oh Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and in their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. What a great psalm. And, and to be able to 
with sincerity in your heart, be able to just go to God and say, God, try me, judge me. Lord, I think I'm doing what's right. God, God, you tell me. You know, reprove me. Look at what I'm doing. Am I not walking in integrity? God, help me out. Show mercy unto me, but, but show, me the, show me the way. And hopefully you're at that point. You know, I, I would to God that everybody is to be able to say, you know what? I think I'm doing like everything right to the best of my ability. Then go to God and say, God, try me. Prove me. Show me where I'm wrong. If you think that everything you're doing is right, then just go to God and say, God, help me out here because I'm not seeing it. There's something that I'm missing because I know I'm not perfect, but I can't see where I'm not doing well or I'm not doing what's right, where I need to change, where I need to fix things. Try me, God. It's good. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, a great uh, way to approach the Lord. I mean, hey, I mean, you know, hopefully we can get to that point. Now, I'm going to close with just a little, uh, one more illustration. It's a little bit out of order here um, in my notes. I kind of had it misplaced apparently, but along the same lines of, of judging and, and looking on other people, I think sometimes people are guilty of a sin. When, when they're guilty of a specific sin, they have a tendency to project that on other people. Yeah. Their own sin will, will, they'll start judging other people or thinking that other people are guilty of what they already have deep down hidden in their heart. And I'll give you an example. There, this, is, this is from a long time ago in my past, but before I was married, when I was dating a girl, and um, I was in college, and I was real busy. I had a job, and I was doing schoolwork, and I was real busy. And um, I remember she wasn't in school or anything, and she had a job. And I remember getting accused of like going out and seeing other girls and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, and, and days when I would be at home, like just doing my, my projects and doing my schoolwork and my classwork and stuff. And then I'd hear from her saying, oh, you're going, you know, it's like, I'm not doing any of that. I mean, I'm innocent. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing here. And then I find out later it's because she was going out and hanging out with other guys and all those and she had this guilty conscience and was projecting that then on me. She didn't want to admit that what she was doing was wrong and she shouldn't have been doing that, whatever, and was trying to make me then look like the person that had this big problem. Now, we need to be able to deal with our own sins and not to not don't be that girl. Right? Don't, don't be that person. Now obviously that's you know that that's just some kind of silly thing, you know, dating girl, whatever. But like it could be any sin. I mean, anything that you're doing wrong, anything that you feel guilty of is easy to project on other people and to just kind of accuse them of doing something wrong. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's situations where both people are in sin, you know, and, and it's easy to think of like, you know, a lot of people here are married, not everybody is, but um, when, when you're married, it's, you know, it, it's the easiest thing to spot where, like maybe the husband and wife are both in sin and it's easy to overlook your own and just focus on your spouses, right? Just, just, just focus more on theirs instead of dealing with your own yourself. And then it turns into this, you know, like, well, you're doing this. Well, you're doing that, you know, and, and, it, and it, nothing gets bettered that way. And guess what? You know, especially those that are married, you're going to be able to find faults with your spouse. It's going to happen. You live together, you know, you're going to be able to find problems where, where you know, your, your spouse is doing something wrong. Don't get focused on the moat in your spouse's eye that you can't see the beam in your own eye. You know, don't, don't get so focused on their problems. You know, we need to learn to judge ourselves. We need to be able to receive correction also. And, um, you know, again, I'm not saying there's never a time for judgment because there is. But keep everything in mind and keep your own humility in check. Keep your own attitude right and, and being willing to accept that you do something wrong. Go to God and ask for forgiveness and get things right before you go out trying to help everybody else around you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instructions that we receive from your word, dear God. 
I pray that you would please help us all to walk in your righteousness and your judgment, dear God. We all, I, I honestly believe that everybody here tonight has, an, has a heart to want to be right with you and not to be screwing up and doing things wrong and, and not serving you to their full potential, dear Lord. I think we all love you enough to want to do those things. Please help us to identify the sin areas of our life. If we, if we aren't aware of them, dear God, bring them up to the surface. Help us to identify us, them and not reject or stiffen our necks when we when we actually do find them but that we would be willing to to make the changes in our own lives dear god and it's in jesus name we pray amen